Thank you, Matthew. So yeah, uh, once again, my name is Jennings. I am a neuroscientist and also a software developer at the Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, what we do at our lab is we do a lot of brain MRI research, but we also are interested in um, actually applying the computational MRI research we do to um, use in the clinic. And so, of course, everyone's hot about developing AI algorithm these days and image processing, but how can we actually make these products of research useful to clinicians when they do their medical practice? So the title of my talk is Modernization of DICOM Workflows. First, we should talk about what DICOM is and why we need to modernize it. DICOM is a international standard for medical image encoding, storage, and transfer. And it's basically found everywhere. It's ubiquitous across hospitals and the industry. No matter what manufacturer you go to, Siemens um, is a big example, or Philips, they will all be using the DICOM protocol. Uh, no matter what hospital you go to, whether it's public or private, uh, European, American, Chinese, any, they will be using the DICOM standard within their cyber infrastructure. Uh, though a lot of people have frustrations with the DICOM protocol, and some even regard it as a legacy protocol. So let's talk about why that is with the history. Just to give a little bit of perspective, um, since we're talking about legacy software here, I'll paint the timeline starting from the uh, pre-2000 era of the internet. And so the HTTP protocol that we all know and love was actually invented in 1996 uh, with the version 1.0 of HTTP. Uh, four years ago uh, in 1992 was the JPEG uh, image format. And so hopefully this just paints a picture of how the young space of technology was developing. Take a moment to guess how old the DICOM protocol is. DICOM was actually invented 11 years before HTTP, and the purpose of it was to facilitate the encoding of MRI images and CT images and figure out how we can store them on magnetic tape drives in a vendor-neutral way. And so this is really, really old technology, but it's still highly relevant today. After 1985, they realized that DICOM protocol needed some revisions. So they came out with a version two and some more changes later down the line. Eventually we get to DICOM version three, where finally they introduced TCP IP support, uh, which is the transfer part of the DICOM protocol, but still to people who might be familiar with modern technologies such as HTTP, HTTP, or maybe even gRPC. Um, DICOM has many strange parts to it that might be alien to us. For example, the client-server relationship is reversed. In DICOM, when we want to request an image from the server, the server has to send us the image rather than us asking the server for that image. Those are technical details that aren't too important. The takeaway here is that DICOM is this uh, almost 40-year-old piece of technology that basically every single medical imaging facility, whether that be a hospital or a research lab, needs to figure out how to navigate themselves. And so how MRI research works, um, basically anywhere in the world, is of course you start with a scan of the patient, and then always you are going to end up with DICOM data on what's known as a PAX server. Uh, PAX is just a fancy word for an image database. And then we want to obtain that DICOM data from the PACs and run some kind of computational pipeline on that. For example, image segmentation uh, in the realm of neuroscience, we're interested in doing the segmentation of the brain regions and then trying to extract surfaces and trying to be able to quantify the size of certain parts of the brain. Receiving DICOM from PACs isn't a trivial issue and it also suffers from a lot of these problems stemming from just the sheer age of the DICOM protocol. Uh, breaking down a little bit of how it works, when you have a single DICOM file, that represents one two-dimensional image, or in the context of MRI, it's going to be a two-dimensional MRI slice. And so one three-dimensional MRI scan can be usually like 100 DICOM files, but if you have a four-dimensional functional MRI scan, that can be over 1,000 to 2,000 DICOM files. 
originally how we set up our architecture in my lab was using a lot of Python code for the infrastructure. And so that works. And you would think it's a good idea because the retrieval of DICOM images is an IO bound task, but we still found a lot of performance bottlenecks using Python. Uh, just receiving a single MRI scan would mean you would need to spawn hundreds of sub-processes and receiving one MRI scan would end up taking anywhere between one to five minutes. Not only that, it would also basically max out the load on some of our supercomputers. So, um, simply put, we rewrote it in Rust. We rewrote part of uh, we rewrote the bottleneck component, which was a piece of code that read the metadata of DICOM images and stored it in a index database to facilitate search. And the Rust version of this component is between 100 to 200 times faster than single-threaded performance of its equivalent written in Python. In fact, this is a somewhat amusing benchmark, but I found that the Rust version of this function actually outperforms the Python interpreter when you try to run the Python interpreter and have it do literally nothing. So if you type Python dash C empty string in the command line, that's going to take more time than it takes for our Rust-based program to process a DICOM file. And so that's great. We rewrote a crucial component in Rust, and then we tried to bring it to production. We've instrumented it with some telemetry, but in production, we've noticed that we do have some more failures. And so what we're looking at here is a Grafana dashboard. Uh, it's kind of small, so I'll try to zoom in. Over here in the top left corner, we just see the number of files being received uh, just every 10 seconds. And we can see that there's an increased number of files received between 11.30 to 12.30, so around noon. Um, but we also see that there are a couple of errors happening um, during the receival of these Vicom images. And looking at our telemetry, what we see is that the memory usage of our Rust-based component is spiking a little bit around the same time. And we see something else. We have another Python server, which is a Django server. And whenever this Django server interacts with our Rust-based DICOM receiver, our Rust-based DICOM receiver is trying to push images to the Django backend. But the problem with the Django backend is whenever it's receiving images from our Rust service, its CPU usage is spiking and the CPU throttling is actually causing some errors here. Oops. So now that we have some problems in production, back to the drawing board, we ended up doing something somewhat heretical, but Thanks to some special features of the Rust compiler um, and also the extraordinary crate SQLX, we were able to figure out a solution to this problem. Um, and what we ended up doing is we would extract the metadata of DICOM images and deposit that into a PostgreSQL database directly. And we would do that without going through the Python Django backend we were also able to optimize the SQL queries like this. And so that would improve our performance a lot. Conventional programming wisdom says that we should avoid this kind of tight coupling between services. And it can in fact be very dangerous to do um, because if these services disagree on what the database schema is, then we can have a lot of confusing errors that can potentially corrupt data. But due to a special feature of the SQLX crate and how it uses macros with the Rust compiler, the SQLX crate is actually able to do online verification of SQL queries. What that means is you write your SQL queries in the Rust code, and when you try to compile it with just a cargo run or cargo build commands, it will actually validate that your SQL queries make sense. So here, I introduce a artificial typo right here in my SQL query. And when I try to compile the program, SQLX is going to tell me that there is an error 
um, and that the relation tax files tax file does not exist. Using these features of SQLX, we were able to do these optimizations in a safe way and prevent any data corruption. In the end, we've been able to further optimize our REST service and finally get it rolled out. From this experience, we've learned a lot about using REST in the realm of uh, cloud development and also scientific development. Some of the advantages we realized of using REST is that these compiler features such as uh, using SQLX macros can facilitate program correctness. Also, of course, one of our main motivations of doing this was to uh, improve the performance. And Rust specifically emphasizes its feature of how it doesn't use garbage collection. And what that ends up um, giving us is stable, but also predictable memory usage. Furthermore, the efficient usage of CPU and memory resources leads to lower costs when we deploy the software on public clouds. And it also enables us to deploy our software on commodity hardware. More on that in a bit. And we're talking about performance a lot. Uh, of course, it's important that we are able to measure the performance as well. And Rust has a really good ecosystem for that through the Tokyo tracing and open telemetry crates. But there are also a bunch of difficulties that we've encountered. Probably the biggest difficulty is about how there is a fragmented ecosystem within the REST uh, third-party library space, um, especially with the sync versus async divide. Some of the libraries that we tried to use, such as the libraries for reading DICOM data, were sync only, whereas some of the libraries, such as the ones to interact with open telemetry, were async only. And so that was complicated to sort out. Lastly, of course, um, as Matthew mentioned in the introduction, Rust is just not as much of a popular language. Most of the work in our domain-specific uh, fields are happening in other languages, such as Python or MATLAB, and that makes it hard to find people uh, within our own domain that also know and understand Rust who can contribute to open source projects. Behold, this is just a picture of the Kubernetes server that we're actually running all of our uh, DICOM processing software on. And it is probably much less fancy than you might have expected. But this is one of the strengths of Rust as well. We do not need any kind of expensive server farm or a um, big team to maintain racks and racks of servers. What we did instead was we just collected the old desktops that are like 10 to 15 years old from just our office space and threw them all into a room, connected them with Kubernetes. And even though some of these boxes are limited to 4 GB of RAM, they can run our Rust services perfectly well due to the efficiency of the programming language. That's all I had to share today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was a great time. I was about to interrupt to say your time is up um, just as you were finishing. Um, that was a really nice talk. Um, I'm very impressed by um, how much you sped up your Python code in that talk. Um, we have one question that's come in so far. So anyone else who has questions, you can still type them in the Q&A box. Um, it's also nice if people, um, I've seen one person done it already, um, just put some like thanks and some hype in chat if you've enjoyed that. Um, because that's always nice because obviously in a real conference we're doing applause and we can't really hear everyone applauding at home um so if anyone wants to you're welcome to type in chat something but the question that's come through is about parallelism so it says how do you do parallelism um do you have a multi-threaded image or do you have multiple single-threaded executables or something else mm -hmm. that's a really good question um and it has to do with the challenges with the sync and async divide in our community and so originally I wanted to use a crate called DICOM RS for processing the DICOM images. That's a sync only crate. So we have no choice but to use uh, threads for parallelism there. Um, but I am also using other dependencies in my project that are async only and depend on the Tokyo uh, runtime 
Tokyo is a async framework for Rust. And so um, right now, the situation of parallelism in our component is rather messy. There is a async thread pool of uh, async workers to deal with all of those Tokyo related tasks. And then there's also a synchronous thread pool to deal with any of the sync only tasks. And so that's not very easy to um, just code up. And it's something that I hope that the Rust community can figure out in the future. Beyond parallelism inside of the application, we also are able to deploy multiple replicas and scale this out horizontally across multiple machines. So you saw my sort of bootleg cluster just literally on the floor there. Um, there's a replica of the service on a couple of the different machines. So there is both vertical and horizontal scalability in our service. 